So one of the things that you mentioned there was that intermittent fasting was like a, a bit of a godsend for you. Uh, it has been highly contested on the internet. Mm-hmm. What is, in your opinion, as someone that has spent a lot of time researching, practicing, and coaching intermittent fasting, what is the optimal structure and the most important foundations to understand about intermittent fasting? After today's video, get a free box of 100% macadamia nut creamer. Literally, the only ingredient is macadamia nuts in this stuff. So you add a little bit of this to your coffee, or you mix it with water and you reconstitute it into a macadamia nut milk. If you look at macadamia nut milks at the grocery store, it is disgusting the amount of things that they add into it. This is literally just macadamia nuts. And if you mix it with water, you've got macadamia nut milk. If you add it to coffee, you've got a creamer. So this is a free box of this stuff with any purchase from House of Macadamia. Plus, you're getting 20% off your entire order through House of Macadamia by using that link down below. So everything is sustainably grown and harvested in South Africa, less than an hour's drive from each other. But the bottom line is, this stuff is so inexpensive compared to other macadamia nut products. Like if you go to the store, especially if you go to Hawaii and you try to buy macadamia, you're looking at like ridiculous, ridiculous prices. Because these guys cut out the middleman, they are the literal house of macadamias, getting you the best prices. So check them out, get your free box of macadamia nut creamer slash milk, however you wanna use it, and 20% off using that code and link down below in the description. The best structure is the structure that works best for you as the individual. It's not the sexiest answer, but it comes with practice and it comes with determining, am I someone that likes to eat in an eight-hour window? Am I someone that likes to eat in a four-hour window or a six-hour window? The best form of intermittent fasting is the one that you don't get addicted to, the one that you can still use as an effective tool without using as a crutch. The best form of intermittent fasting for the individual is going to be the one that you feel the best on, the one that you get the heightened mental alertness, that clarity that you seek out. The moment that you start to do it because of an arbitrary number is the moment that you've already lost the battle. The biggest benefit to me with intermittent fasting is not body composition changes. It's not cognitive awareness. It's not this. It's the element of mastery that comes with it. And that's where people miss the boat because you cannot contest that. You can sit here and you can fight every single nook and cranny of intermittent fasting based upon where you stand in your views of nutrition, time-restricted feeding. You say, oh, well, caloric restriction is just as good. Well, yeah, intermittent fasting is kind of caloric restriction. You know, this, that, whatever. You cannot argue with me that there is an element of mastery that comes into place with abstaining from something. We talked about this with caffeine. We talked about this with alcohol. Food is a drug that we are constantly exposed to which means that it's incredibly difficult to abstain from it in a proper way. And we are bombarded with social cues to tell us that it's okay to eat whenever we want. Is that the truth? Like, should we eat whenever we want? Should we eat ad libitum? I don't know. I mean, it's certainly real world because that's the world we live in today, but is it accurate? Is it, is it fair to assume that that's how we should eat? Regardless of your beliefs there, being able to abstain from food and having the control to do so seemingly gives me control in much much many other, or gives me control in a lot of other elements of my life. And maybe that reflects back to my childhood and wanting to have some control, Mm -hmm. but there are a hell of a lot of people that respond in a very similar fashion to I do. That's very interesting. The fact that it's about the story that you tell yourself to do with the intermittent fast, as much as it is to do with some magic that comes along for the ride. Yeah. I had uh, Peter Atira on the show yesterday and he said the exact same thing. Every study that he has found so far hasn't suggested that there is any secret source hiding in time-restricted eating beyond caloric restriction, that there is no, um, it it just doesn't seem, it seems to be a very easy to follow route for caloric restriction. Is that your reading of the literature as well? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think there is a little bit of nuance there. I think that people that are severely metabolic, I think that people that are severely metabolically deranged and have severe metabolic disorder, uh, probably get different benefit, slightly different benefit because there's something that needs to be unraveled there. And I think Peter's actually even talked about that. It's like people that, uh, when you're in a severe situation where you are very, very unhealthy, then abstaining from food in particular time fashions could have other advantages. 
Uh, the autophagy. And stuff well, like autophagy that. is one of these things. Like it's a word that's thrown around, right? It's it's. Is it bullshit? Is autophagy bullshit? It's not bullshit, but it's definitely not this magic. Like it's happening all the time, right? It's ha- if I go into a caloric deficit, or if I take some time in between meals, or you know what the biggest driver of autophagy is is exercise, right? Nobody talks about that. That's not sexy. You can't say like, oh, like exercise is going to induce autophagy. It's going to induce it three times more than fasting will. Now, there are different types of autophagy. There's macro autophagy, micro autophagy. There's lipophagy, which is where you're actually uh, sort of recycling fat cells. All different varying forms that happen at varying levels based upon what someone is doing. Fasting, exercise, general caloric restriction. And autophagy is dictated a lot of times by many things, but at the very simple level, AMPK phosphorylation which is a dimmer switch, not a light switch. So yes, the more aggressive the caloric restriction, the more aggressive the exercise-induced deficit, the more aggressive the autophagic flux. Now, with that being said, it's like you can turn that to a certain degree and it's probably going to reach a maximum before you start like degrading tissue and having a negative outcome. So it's not a light switch where it's like as soon as you go into a deficit, you flip a switch and you have maximum autophagy. The argument with that is like, okay, well, intermittent fasting, you're abstaining from food, you're ending up in that caloric restricted phase significantly faster because you're just not eating. So one could argue that you flip that dimmer switch a little bit faster. And if you combine that with exercise, maybe you get more autophagy. That's certainly a valid argument, but it does not, does not warrant us to say that like intermittent fasting is the best way to get autophagy, not by any means. Okay. What about building muscle while fasting? So- I think it sounds almost insane to say like, while you're literally fasting, you're going to build muscle. Uh, It's funny enough. I think Peter Atia had actually mentioned some point in the past, like muscle protein breakdown and muscle protein synthesis are always a balance of each other. And when you are in a fasted state, you have a high degree of muscle protein breakdown. That does not mean that you're necessarily catabolizing muscle. What it implies is that you could be breaking down tissue from one area of your body. And then after the fast is complete, when muscle protein synthesis increases, you reestablish formation in another area of your body or in that same area, right? So as long as basic protein needs are met within your eating period, you absolutely can build muscle with intermittent fasting. But I think there's a line. I usually kind of draw an arbitrary line at like 24 hours. I feel like if you're doing consistent 24-hour fast, like every other day, perhaps it's harder to build muscle. But if someone's doing like an 18-6, three or four days per week, of course you can build muscle. I talked about this recently. Look at your calories over the course of a seven-day period, not daily. Like if you want to be in a surplus, be in a slight surplus at the end of the week. If you want to be in a deficit, be in a slight deficit at the end of the week. Maybe Monday you eat 4,000 calories. Maybe Tuesday you eat 1,000. Maybe Wednesday you eat 4,000. Maybe Thursday you eat 1,500. It's like that constant undulation might be good for the human metabolism because it doesn't reset every night at midnight to zero. What about looking at a a fat loss plan overall, if you were to design the non-negotiables that should go into it, regardless of time restricted, regardless of how someone is coming into this, what are the non-negotiables for a fat loss plan? Yeah. For me, I still have to side with just about everybody and say thermodynamics are probably the most important thing. Are we going to discover that to possibly be different later in the life? We might, who knows? We always have to be open to that. But I think right now the evidence is just too strong to ignore that, that thermodynamics matter. Too many camps trying to like oppose that. So let's just all agree on that. When you say that, you mean Keiko, right? You mean calories in, calories out. Yeah, which is a very complicated matter. It's not as simple as people think, but people try to make it simple for the sake of content. But it is very complex because there's all kinds of influential factors that determine that, right? How much calories we're actually burning, how much we're actually consuming. Uh, Did you juice this fiber? Yep. Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it, it, all kinds of stuff that comes into play. Um, the other piece that I think is a non-negotiable is having adequate breaks between meals. I feel for me, at least, that's a non-negotiable. And the reason that that comes under fire a lot is because that implies that you're suggesting that insulin has to always be low. Not at all. I'm suggesting that we have periods of time between meals that we do allow insulin to be low. Maybe that's an 18 hour fast. Maybe it's just having adequate three hours between meals. I think for maximum- what, what, what would be the problem with just grazing every hour and a half? Personally, well, even an hour and a half, as long as you were just like taking that adequate break because you have this spike in insulin and that insulin level needs to come down for glucagon, the counter-regulatory hormones to release, which are ultimately going to allow fat loss to occur. Like lipolysis, as far as I know, cannot occur 
in the presence of insulin. Like if insulin is elevated at that particular moment, lipolysis cannot occur at that moment. You cannot be utilizing fat while insulin is elevated. That doesn't mean that you never spike insulin. That means you keep track of when things go up and down. Your fat burning mode isn't right when you eat, contrary to the whole thermic effect of food thing. Like that's such a negligible amount. The fat burning occurs after the insulin levels have come back down to baseline and lipolysis and beta oxidation can occur. So I think maybe it's not a non-negotiable as far as the general world is concerned because you could effectively eat like a pea every five minutes and be eating 800 calories. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think for adequate muscle preservation and for maximum fat loss, I think just keeping a keen eye to that is very beneficial. Um, <clears throat> other non-negotiables, uh, I think G-flux is a very important thing that's not talked about enough. Uh, that's energy flux. I subscribe to this, man. Yeah. I realized this as soon as I started doing CrossFit. Yeah, right? It's, it's you know, you know what's crazy is uh, I've had, you know, Alan Aragon? No. Uh, he's, he's great. You should have him on. He's, he's uh, just, he's basically the person that takes a lot of these major research papers and like writes the summaries for them. Like he's like that well-versed. So he basically writes the condensed summary. So he's so good at articulating. In fact, I literally like, I did a number of videos with him just because he's so well-spoken on this stuff. And he and I were talking about it. It's like, have you ever been in the presence of like an athlete that is just a crazy intense athlete with a lot of energy? It's like you're around them and you can like literally feel their energy. Compare that to someone that's on their deathbed. There's like a completely different, like it's, they're literally fluxing at a different capacity. And people don't realize that there's like a mobilization cost or fee associated with more energy and using more energy. So if you eat 2000 calories per day and burn 2000 calories per day, and I eat 5,000 calories per day and burn 5,000 calories per day, you'd say, Hey, you guys are both at net zero, right? Wrong. I'm actually burning more because there is more energy cost and G flux, energy flux involved at a higher rate of metabolism. It's almost like the mobilization fee. It costs, it costs money. It costs currency to mobilize that much energy. It's like, if you call someone over to replace your windshield, they're going to charge you a mobilization fee because it costs them money to get there. So every time you have an energy exchange, it costs currency. The more you eat and the more you move, the more you burn overall. This was what I realized when starting CrossFit that I'd always, up until that point, because I was doing bro split bodybuilding, which means that really, unless you're doing incredibly intense sessions, how are you losing? You're not going to put yourself into a caloric deficit through training. You're going to do it through food, right? So it's always this sort of race chasing your tail of like fewer calories to beget fewer calories to beget lower metabolism to beget fewer calories. And I start doing CrossFit and I'm like, okay, my I need to eat three and a half thousand calories just to not be hungry when doing this. And I got leaner and I thought, oh, that's strange. And then I started training more and getting heavier and getting fitter and leaner. I was like, I'm, I keep on eating more and more food and yet I'm getting leaner because I couldn't put enough food away in order to be able to compensate for the deficit that the training was putting me in. And I understand, I understand that you have much more control over the food that goes in your mouth than the calories that you expend through your output. I, I, ben Carpenter came on the show and gave me a really beautiful framework that helped me to understand why losing fat for most people through caloric restriction rather than the increase of exercise is at least something that they have a greater degree of control over. I think that that seems to make a good bit of sense to me. But for the people that do have it in the tank to be able to go and do high intensity training with progressive overload, with some loading multiple times, maybe per day or at least every day, G flux theory for me, which is the 3,000 and 3,000 3, in 3,000 out versus 2,000 in 2,000 out, that seemed to make a massive difference as far as I could see. Dude, it's it's huge. I love Ben, by the way. Dude, that guy is great. Like, He's he, fantastic. He does a really good job of uh, just distilling things and just uh, humanizing it. Like he just like, so there's not not a lot of people that I really... Like, and he's kind of come on the scene recently for me. Like I've just... Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, just... I mean, just... He's crushing it. Kudos to him. He's doing good. What else? But, Anything else? So, well, kind of dovetailing off the G flux thing, I think the non-negotiable that also comes into play is adequate diet breaks. Like, so that comes with the G flux. Like it, if you just continually restrict calories, you're going to end up in that, that cesspool of just, and that happens so much with intermittent fasting. It's relevant, right? Because people say, oh, I'm going to do 16, eight fasting. So they restrict calories. And then next thing they know, 
Like they think they're fasting, but all they're doing is restricting calories. Like sure, they're eating in a certain time block, but that doesn't absolve them of thermodynamics, right? So at the same time, there's like restrict calories and then they have to restrict calories more. And then they're like, oh, well, I'm eating 1800 calories a day or 1500 calories a day because I'm intermittent fasting, but I'm fasting every day. Why isn't this working anymore? Well, because you're doing the same damn thing as just restricting calories, right? Now, reintrodu- <clears throat> now reintroducing calories and being able to actually get the metabolism back up to a, an adequate state involves applying G flux with proper diet breaks. So what I mean by that is you can't just say, I'm going to have a diet break and start eating a bunch of shit. If you do that, things are going to go cattywampus. You're going to have compensatory mechanisms that come into play that make you gain fat very fast. Probably because, because you've driven it through you've the driven flow. It down and all of, yeah. So people make the mistake of going back to eating like they used to eat. No, you have to increase the calories to where you are at maintenance now which is very difficult for people to understand because- Reverse diet back up gently. Yeah, well, people don't, and most people aren't going to figure that out. They're not going to say like, okay, I've lost 30 pounds of lean mass, 20 pounds of fat mass. That means I need to adjust my calories to baseline at this for maintenance. So the easiest way to do that is when you get to those stages, if it's possible, increase your intensity of training to allow for increase in calories. That way you're increasing that flux while taking a diet break in a very- conservative fashion that limits the risk of fat regain, but still allows for metabolic rate to increase and your RMR to come back up. Right. Because that's then going to allow you to uh, increase metabolic rate without gaining too much more weight, which then allows you to rebegin another diet from the top with this higher base metabolic rate. Right. Okay. Nailed it. How do you square the circle of one of the biggest predictors of longevity being caloric restriction with G-flux theory? Yeah. So I, this has come to battle, right? Like I've, I've seen this popped up in the comments for me multiple times. It's like, okay, where do you draw the line? And this is where I almost feel like, is this where fractal eating and kind of breaking up how we eat could be beneficial? Like, because where do you draw the line of caloric restriction? Like is caloric restriction daily? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? Is it yearly? Like when, who's counting? How do we know? Is it protein restriction? We don't really know. Is it mTOR phosphorylation? Like where, where do you really draw this line? So that is a use case where I could say, okay, maybe fractal eating makes sense. Maybe you eat in a surplus or slight surplus with a lot of activity one day and then lower activity, lower intake another day so that your net over the course of the week maybe is a slight deficit, but you have adequate muscle stimulus to still preserve muscle. The problem that you have if you, if you choose to do that is that it's not a very routinized life, nope, right? You know, not. so in a, a sandbox perhaps, or a Petri dish, or a spreadsheet, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to humans want to do the same thing most days, I want to train five days a week and have weekends off. I want to do three days on one day off. I want to do whatever, right? Like the, a more co- the more complex and fractal that you make the routine, the more poor the adherence and compliance is going to be. Could per- people possibly just periodize quarterly? I mean, is that yes. is that too yes. much to ask? So that would people? be that would be easier. Say, hey, let's say let's look at this globally over the course of a year. Yeah. Let's say this quarter, I want you to be in a slight surplus. This quarter, I want you to be in a slight deficit and just keep on going back and forth quarterly. You know, no one knows the answers to this, obviously. Otherwise, we'd all be living to be a thousand years old. Uh, but then, you know, it brings up the equation of, uh, of the protein thing too, right? Like methionine and all this stuff, like protein, is it aging us? Is what, pro- what's your read at the moment? I asked Peter this yesterday so I can compare and contrast your answers. There's interesting arguments on both sides. Um, I do think that the methionine research makes sense. I do think that there's a a large plant-based kind of skew to it that sort of distorts how we look at that data. I try to look at that data objectively without sort of the plant-based skew and say, how do we apply this methionine um, discussion and protein contributing to aging independent of any plant-based discussion? Can this apply for the Mediterranean diet where there's still moderate meat consumption? Uh, And I think the answer is yes. I do think that being able to have adequate mTOR phosphorylation is very important for adequate recovery. I think that we are learning- This lear- means eating meat. Eating right. meat. Yes, yeah, sorry. I, I, so I think it's very important for recovery. I think it's very important for cellular signaling. I think insulin is one of the most important hormones for longevity too. And you know, as a peptide hormone, it, it, it comes under fire as this demonized thing, but I think insulin is also a catalyst for repair. So- it is a balance, but do you balance at 51% towards the mTOR phosphorylation side or 51% more towards the AMPK side where you're trying to be like, I'm going to restrict. Um, and with that, 
I lean slightly in the camp of being on the mTOR side, being protein being more important than restriction of protein. I think adequate amounts of protein with caloric restriction might be somewhat of the answer. This is an area that I find quite confusing because I've got on one side friends like Michaela Peterson, Mark Bell, uh, and also my own felt sense that when I do lean more heavily into meat that I think I perform better, Mm. I feel better, uh, my body is better. Um, the feedback that I got from Marik Health after I did my blood panel was the same. Let's, we need to get some organ meats in there. Let's eat some more red meats. And then I see the other side of the world, especially the longevity biohacking side that sort of demonizes a lot of this. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen Brian Johnson. Have you mm-hmm. seen that guy? What do you mm-hmm. think of him? What do you think of his approach to, to the world? So he sort of uh, got the approach of, I mean, moderately low protein, right? Yeah. So it's, you know, other than kind of the surface level stuff with the moderate low protein, I don't follow or subscribe to his way of thinking, so I can't comment aggressively. But I think that the more that we can thoughtfully acknowledge both sides, that's that's really important. Because again, like we have to ask ourselves the question, like, are we looking at this through a wide angle lens or not? So like, what is happening globally? Like, what is your protein intake? Like, are you in a net positive protein balance? Is, I don't know this. I mean, you might be able to answer it. Is like, is Brian suggesting that you be in a, like a net negative protein balance? I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, he's coming on the show in a few weeks. So I'm going to ask him. Yeah. It's, I mean, a, I still think a net, like a net neutral protein balance would be optimal, but no one's going to What does to, that mean? That means your muscle protein synthesis is matching that exactly of your muscle protein breakdown, but who's going to be able to figure that out. Right? right. So that would be the ideal situation. So until we have a way to measure that, we're always going to be in a slight surplus which could be more, you know, methionine could be more issues uh, facing as far as longevity is concerned, or you're slightly on the opposite. So for me, like, how do we attenuate certain things and activate AMPK and activate these markers that are associated with longevity and caloric restriction while also maintaining protein levels? Because I don't think protein is the problem. I think it's one of many different elements. And if you look at the blue zones, which people talk smack on the blue zones, um, and understandably so. What's the blue zones for the people that don't know? Blue zones are the uh, areas of the world that have the people that live the longest. So you've got like Costa Rica, you've got Sardinia, you've got Greece, you've got, you know, so uh, Okinawa. And I did a video on this because I was so interested. I was like, we focus so much on the common denominators of these regions. We say, oh, well, all of them eat in a 10 to 15% caloric restriction. All of them eat low meat. Well, that's not necessarily true. All of them eat X fat. All of them do this. All of them do that. It's like, you guys are trying to find the common denominators. I want to find the outliers. What makes these unique? What makes the Okinawan diet so unique and different from the other blue zones? What makes the Costa Rican diet so different from Sardinia? Let's look at the outliers and take those outliers and craft the ultimate longevity diet. And that video crushed. Like, I think it just like got people thinking. There was no scientific rigor to it whatsoever. Other than what were like, the main takeaways? Now, the main takeaways of it were like, okay, uh, high omega high omega three content, uh, moderate polyunsaturated fat content, uh, fruit polyphenols, uh, fiber and diversity of diet. So you've got things like uh, Okinawans eat a crap load of like purple sweet potatoes. You know things like that, right? And looking at that still being in somewhat of a deficit, but that deficit being more from like 1% to 8% versus a universal 15%. So a slight deficit, no scientific rigor to that whatsoever. It's just looking and pulling outliers and being like, what are the benefits of these outliers? And if we combine that, is that doing something? And I just encourage people to look at things like that because we're so quick to look for patterns that we forget about the power of an outlier pulling an average. Mm. So you mentioned the thermic effect of food earlier on, somebody that you're a little bit more familiar with than Brian Johnson would be (laughs) V-Shred. I am V-Shred. What is your reading of V-Shred and his work in the world of diet and fitness? I don't give two craps what V-Shred does. does. I just don't want people to confuse me with him anymore. Do you see why people confuse you with V-Shred? Well, we're both charlatan total. (laughs) 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 Dude, you're significantly bigger and leaner than him. But well, that's a plus, thank you. If, if it was a dark, foggy night, I could see why people could confuse you for him. Well, isn't that the most most of social media? Like, I mean, it's a dark, foggy night for most people. That's If you put enough filters on, it is. Yeah, interesting. I mean, you'll speak to Z later on about this, but um, he did a 
a series of adverts because you can go on. I didn't know you could do this, but if you go find out someone's ad manager account or something, <laughs> or you can press on a, a particular page and see all of the adverts that they're running on Facebook. <laughs> um, and they went on and had a look at all of the different adverts that Vshred was doing. <laughs> and in one of them, they'd set him up in a studio kind of like this uh, that had the same red curtain, the same mic arm, the same mic, the same uh, like muffler top, the same desk, the same lighting as Rogan's studio. But he wasn't on Rogan. And it was him giving, doing basically an ad read fake on a podcast. I'm like, yo, we don't need chat GPT and AI to CGI like horse shit down our brains. Like people can do this in person at the moment. That, that I mean, brings V shred up to Zach later on. Cause he's got very strong opinions on the guy. Um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I saw that months ago and I actually sent a screenshot it to my team. I was look at this guy. Like, like he's literally faking being on Rogan. And now, no, I noticed that it's a couple months later. It's like circulating around. Um, but I mean, like if my shirt's off and my hair is styled the way it normally is, like it's, it's, it's ridiculous. I did a video on it. Like, uh, I don't know, three, four, five months ago. And dude, I mean, hundreds of comments being like, I thought you were him. Like, I'm sorry. Like I was really confused. I still, Wait, you're not. Have you, him? Ever con- have you ever considered that you might be like cleaning up V Shred's uh, public image? Hundred percent. V Shred's really got his mind deep into the data here. He's reading the white papers. It really sounds like he's been educating himself. Uh, well, it's it comes up dude. as he people, holds on to the coattails of your like people, hard work. The like the best comment I saw was like, you know, oh well, like I thought that you had all this really good content going organically so that you could afford the ability to be more aggressive in your ad campaigns, uh, you know, and be very superficial and simple in your ad campaigns, be more aggressive because people are, you know, they're not subscribed. They're watching your other content where it's very deep and very uh, scientifically backed. Yeah. It's, it's becoming an actual battle that I have to deal with where. Consider maybe a really aggressive, uh, like design change, like a, gender reassignment perhaps or like a pink hair like grow it out you, i just think one of you needs to change and it might as well be you well dude i had an idea what if i what if i reached out to them and i said hey do what you want with this ad it's all good but i want to film an ad with v shred and yet actually like have both of us standing there and be like i'm tom stellauer i'm v shred we have opposing views stop confusing us and then just let him go upon his merry way. That would be fun. That would, it would probably convert really well for them Yeah, because it's just different. It would, they spend millions of dollars on ad spend a month. So it would get it out there. And it would sanitize you from him. Yep. Very nice. Very nice. You need to do like a, you need to identify, I have a freckle on this side. You'll notice that his ears are a little bit, or like whatever. You need to identify those. So getting back to fat loss, one of the other, so the, the other side of it, we've spoken a lot about diet High intensity interval training is something that people focus on an awful lot, specifically for fat loss. I remember being at university 13 years ago, and my first lads' holiday was coming up, try, getting into the gym to do fasted cardio first thing in the morning. If somebody is thinking, I want to use high intensity interval training or zone two to improve my fat loss, what are the principles, the most important principles that they need to know? Okay. Yeah. With high intensity interval training, I am a very firm believer that the magic is in the intensity of the interval itself. Far too many people go into HIT training with like, I'm going to do one minute on, one minute off, one minute on, one minute off. That's not really HIT training, if you ask me. That's more just high intensity training. That's not high intensity interval training. The magic of the high intensity interval training comes from the fact that your interval should be as close to maximal as possible. And if you are able to hold maximum intensity for one minute, you're insane. That's, that's not going to happen. You've got 15, maybe 20 seconds in you. So my idea of high intensity interval training is like 15 to 25 seconds, maximum intensity. And then however long it takes me to recover to be able to adequately go at that intensity again, maybe it's two minutes, maybe it's a minute, maybe it's five minutes, probably not five minutes. It's probably realistically somewhere in the realm of like two minutes. Mm. That is, to me, high-intensity interval training. Other forms of training where you're going one minute on, one minute off, that's more like various forms of Tabata, really, which has its place. Very good for calorie burning, but it's not the same as interval training. Is there something, is there some secret source in maximal output for fat loss? 
Uh, I mean, a lot of central nervous system stimulation. So that definitely has uh, an afterburn effect. Uh, there's definitely a more glycogen depletion because you're very, very, very glycolytic when you're using that intensity. So if you're trying to deplete and you're trying to get in a carb deprived state, uh, there's certainly evidence there for sure. Uh, arguably you won't even burn as many calories. So is it the most effective? Not necessarily, but it's certainly good for the metabolism. What would you prescribe if somebody was going to introduce training overall? They want to add maybe two or three sessions in per week. They say, I really want to add on top of an existing exercise protocol. Where would you go to? We might not go to the high intensity interval training. Would you suggest something more like a Tabata? I love, I love Tabata training. I love, I love EMOM style training. You know, for me, it's like every minute on the minute, whether it's cardio based, whether it's resistance training, dude, it keeps me honest. A clock always keeps me honest and it keeps me moving, keeps my heart rate elevated. But with an EMOM, I can fluctuate it every minute on the minute. If I wanted to go relatively, if I want to do sets of five on bench press, I could do that in EMOM fashion and taper and drop set accordingly. Like you could do so much with an EMOM. I know Marcus Philly's a big fan of that too. And he and I both are, are just big on EMOMs. It's just such a way to combine cardio and resistance training, but also such a unique way to just do cardio. Like you could do, I'm going to do 20 minutes of every minute on the minute, and I'm going to have five different cardio things that I'm going to do. Yep. I'm going to do 10 burpees for one minute, you know, or for however many I can do 10 burpees in that. And then the rest of the time I have that break. Yep. The next time I'm going to do 20 calories on the echo bike or whatever. Yep. So it keeps it fresh. It keeps it exciting. keeps the mind going. So you're not bored. Uh, it's not repetitive on the joints. It's awesome. It's external accountability as well. Totally. It, for, for the people that aren't uh, like CrossFit pilled yet, introducing EMOMs into your training, especially if it's starting to run out of motivation, it's just like having a coach in the room with you, but the coach is just your watch. Uh, because even trying to do timed rest periods when doing bodybuilding, you pick up your phone. You like you, yeah. If you've got 25 seconds or 30 seconds of rest, you don't have enough time to go over and dick about on your phone, you go, look, it's a 20 minute or a 30 minute EMOM for 30 minutes. I'm doing this thing as opposed to saying, I'm going to do like four by 12 on this exercise and four by 12 on that exercise and four by 12 on the third exercise. And there will be a one minute break in between you go. Uh, it's not the same. It's not the same because you're not accountable to the clock. I'll give you two of my favorite workouts that I do. The first one is a uh, descending pyramid of reps for any gymnastics movement. So uh, handstand press up. This is great for push ups. This is great for uh, pull ups, particularly. So, those are the three movements I like to do this with most. So, you warm up on the movement, however long you need to do that. And then you do a single set of max reps on that movement, strict. So, it'd be strict pull ups, strict handstand push ups, strict push ups, two minute rest. Then you take 50% of what that number was. You do that, one minute rest, 50%, one minute rest. And then you do 25% with 30 seconds rest four times. So you do it 100% with two minutes, 50% with one minute mm. twice, and then 25% with 30 seconds four times. And the reason that I love that workout is that it's over and done with in usually about eight minutes. You have worked maximally each time, pretty much. You are basically creating an RPE for the day that everything else then gets percentaged off. So if you go in and you're feeling shit hot, you've slept great, you've fed great, you're hydrated, your energy's good, you go in and you go, oh, holy shit, my first set on strict pull-ups was 16 reps there. I'm now looking at eights and fours for the rest of the day. Like, this is going to hurt. But, well, yeah, but your 100% was that big for a reason because you came in and you felt great. Or one day you go in and it's 11, you go, okay, I'm looking at like sixes and threes. Fine, okay, well, we'll, we'll, work, we'll work with that. Um, I really love it for that reason. Uh, and it's just, it's over and done with so quickly. And you can always continue. Okay, what did I get last time on the first one? Right, I'll keep on pushing that. So that's my favorite for that. And then when it comes to cardio, this is a, an exercise I did on a Concept 2 bike hook ages ago, but it would work just as well on a row. It would work just as well on a ski. You do uh, pretty high intensity as much as you can. Uh, two minutes off, uh, two minutes on, one minute off, six rounds. One minute on, 30 seconds off eight rounds, 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off, 10 rounds. That's it. That's done in about 40 minutes or so. Uh, and that's a really nice recovery workout. And again, it's the same, starting off big, getting down to small. Those are my two favorites. Yeah, man. I love any kind of like ascending or descending ladder. Like they're just, they do something with my brain. They just work. Like it's just like it clicks. Well, you're always motivated, right? Because there's always something coming next. You're always excited about, oh, like, yeah. So I've got, 
uh, one more of the twos left, and then that's like you know, I'm nearly halfway done, and then you end up doing this complex arithmetic in your mind to be able to work out right. Well, I'm actually in terms of working time, I'm nearly halfway done when I get to you know the second set of the whatever, whatever. Um, when it comes to dieting and uh, a lot of people, as me included, with my Coke Zero, have a sweet tooth mm-hmm. and don't want to absolutely wreck our diet when it comes to satisfying that. What are your favorite personal hacks or best pieces of advice for how people can satiate their sweet tooth without pumping a shit ton of calories and, and bad stuff into them? I'm going to, I'm going to give you one that's really interesting. And if you clip this, make sure you add this note that this is mechanistic data. Okay. But it's interesting. And anecdotally, it seems to work. We have what are called NST neurons in our hindbrain. And a lot of times when we're craving something sweet, we're starting to see some research that we could actually be craving something salty. And it's kind of a gustatory response with the vagus nerve and what happens with the hindbrain. And what I have found, and again, it could just purely be anecdotal or placebo, having some salt actually kills that craving. And it does for me. Like every time I'm really craving something sweet, if I have something salty or just some electrolytes or something like that, it feels like that just scratches that itch so quick. It's somewhat temporary. Like it goes away fast, but there's enough small scale data for me to say, Hey, this might actually work, but not enough, you know, observational data to say hundred percent works. Okay. So first thing is potentially look at throwing some element, perhaps in water, exactly. knocking that back. Cause you'll get a little bit of sweetness in that too. See if that blunts it. If the gravity force field pull of our desire for sweet stuff, what are some suggestions on foods that people could go to that you're okay with? Dude, I'm still a fan of like going for like 90% dark chocolate. That still has a little bit of sugar in it. Like, don't be afraid. It's not going to kill you. But the endorphins that you get out of the chocolate, like uh, endorphins is kind of a colloquial way of putting it, but there are basically flavanols in it that do have an impact on neurotransmitter function. And that's been demonstrated in quite a few studies that people feel really good after they have chocolate. So that way you're getting that dopamine itch scratched, but it's not from the sugar. It's more so from the fact that the chocolate and the theobromine is kind of having that impact. So that's a, that's a nice hack. The only downside is, you know, if you do too much of it, it's still pretty caloric. Right. Okay. Another concern that I'm starting to see people talk about more on (laughs) in my corner of the internet is bloating after people have food. Mm -hmm someone hasn't done a, a FODMAP diet, they haven't, you know, gone and done restrictions on on the foods that they're doing. What are the most likely culprits, do you think, that people should be looking at if they do suffer with bloating? I think, uh, I mean, gut dysbiosis is a huge one. I What's think that? that's just a lack of diversity of food within your diet, a lack of diversity of fibers. So you're looking at very simple gut imbalance. Okay, if you imagine a forest with wolves and squirrels and you have one wolf and you have 30 squirrels and you throw a bunch of food into the bunch of, you know, corn or something out there. And the squirrels all eat that corn. The wolf might eat that corn, but the squirrels are going to eat that corn and their population is going to proliferate, right? That's going to grow. Suddenly you've got this crazy imbalance and this dysbiosis. But if you were to have wolves and you were to have squirrels and you were to have some possums and you were to have a, like a nice delicate ecosystem with lots of different animals and you threw that food in there, they'd all compete for that food and they'd all grow at, you know, somewhat proportional rates. And that's what we're really lacking a lot of times in the diet. And I know it has a little bit of a skew that people don't necessarily agree with sometimes, but it's not suggesting that everyone goes out, eats a bunch of fiber. One of the things that we do see across the board is that it's pretty well demonstrated that healthy guts are associated with a diverse diet. And having diversity of different fibers, diversity of different foods in general, whether it's proteins, whether it's fibers, even fats, and this all has an impact. So I think in this day and age, we get really used to eating the same kind of things over and over. If you talk to people, like they don't, they're like, yeah, maybe I go to this restaurant one night and this restaurant another night, but they're not diversifying their gut microbiome the way that I think they should. Like I really do try my best to like rotate different vegetables that I eat, rotate different sources of fiber. I'll have chia some days and then I'll have uh, sweet potatoes another day. I really do try to rotate that up and that helped my bloating issues. Uh, my wife dealt with SIBO with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth for a number of years. Uh, for her, kind of going back down to baseline with a ketogenic diet helped her a lot, uh, but probably just because it's eliminating so much of those fibers. It's eliminating so much that it just brought her back down to baseline that when she reintroduced, everything sort of recalibrated. And I know a lot of people preach that. It's just not necessarily validated with research. 
I have a friend uh, called the Meat Mafia podcast. Have you heard of that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that both of those guys, same thing. You know, like really, really bad uh, stomach issues. You are going to be on medication for the rest of your life. And they just went on a really aggressive elimination, got themselves to the stage where it seemed like their stomach had been given enough time to get rid of inflammation, calm down, rebalance itself. And then they slowly reintroduced foods. And it, it seemed like what the stomach needed, it wasn't chronic. It was acute and consistent. And once you gave that acute problem a little bit of time to calm down, there wasn't necessarily an underlying chronic problem under that. And it just allowed them to, they can relatively eat whatever they want. Um, it's fascinating, man. I, I think that, you know, the work that you do, Ben, Peter, Andrew, everybody, uh, is really helping to educate people. It's a very, I've been someone that's been training for 15 years and I find it still now. I'm like, fuck, is sugar in or out this month? Like, am I allowed it? Should I, do I have to, should I have berries after I have meat? Is meat and fruit cool now? Or should I, do I need to, you know, it's it, it, the the trends that come and go, the um, murkiness of not only what is being communicated, but even the studies that this is coming out of uh, and all of the perverse incentives, I think the work that you do is very impressive. For the people that are listening that want to check out more that you do, where should they go? Yeah, uh, vshred.com. No, <laughs> no it's, uh, 